That's a, a sweet smelling savor. And we're going to start from Genesis chapter 8. You know, when it comes to smell, God has given us that sense uh, to be able to recognize uh, the different smells that God's created. The reason why uh, we smell because God cre created that sense in us. And then at the same time, he's created things to smell a certain way. When you smell a rose, when you smell nutmeg, you can smell that there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, there's different things on this earth, whether it be someone cooking a burger, chicken, food. God gave things a certain smell without us giving us that sense of nose or putting that smell inside those things. They would, it would smell like nothing. It would have nothing in it. But that's uh, one of the things that God as a creator has done for us. And he gives the description of how he sees righteousness or wickedness. As because we can see the definition of smell, and he is giving us those details concerning how he sees righteousness or wickedness. It's either a sweet smell or it's either a stink. In Genesis chapter 8, we know that God told Noah that he was going to destroy the world because of their wickedness, their imagination was evil, evil continually. Um, and what God did is told Noah, and I want to start at Genesis chapter 7, uh, verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. He says, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male, he says, and his female. Of fowls also the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Now I want to look at a few things because there's some animals that he brought up to just two, uh, male and female. Then the, it describes sevens. He says, take them by sevens. And so we go to Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. The scripture says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every thing living, as I have done. So he said this in his heart. But it was written. And it was revealed. The Holy Spirit revealed what was in his heart at this time. Because when this was written. Was not the time that it was done. It happened hundreds of years after. Concerning Moses. And here it says. In verse 20. Took every clean beast and every clean fowl. We just read in Genesis chapter 7. That he took seven. Of the clean he took sevens. So that means he had extra animals. To do a sacrifice for. He says of every each in each one. So when it comes to two. If you grab one chicken and one chicken. And bring them on board. Uh, you kill one for a sacrifice. And that you that means you can't create more chickens. So when it comes to the seven. He says of the seven. He grabbed one of each of the clean. And so verse number 22. While the earth remained. Seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter. And day and night shall not cease. And you know the covenant that he made was a rainbow. I seen the rainbow yesterday when it was raining a little bit. And so I, it just reminded me of the covenant that he made with Noah uh, when it comes to not flooding the earth again. In verse number 22 he says, While the earth remained, seed time and harvest, cold, heat, summer and winter, day and night. He could See, what God could do is he could just leave two. He could have winter and, and summer. He could just completely remove spring, remove fall. He could just have, he could change the world as he, as he desires to. Before that day that it flooded, it didn't rain. It, the Bible says that it was dew. All of a sudden now it rained, it rained that day and it continues to rain. So God has full control, but his sacrifice that he sacrificed, the Bible says the Lord smelled a sweet savor. After he did that sacrifice, you know, and God does the same thing for us. He sweet. He smells sweet savor. Oh, when he sees our righteous acts, when he sees our walk, 
when he sees us smell like Christ, when he sees us follow his will. Look at the scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, because we can go contrary to go contrary to his will, and we can have a different type of smell. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 1, it says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth the little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Just a little folly. A little folly, he compares it to a fly, dead flies in the apothecary. It, me, it sends a stinking savor. It makes it stink. So what is it describing? So it describes it to a saint that has a reputation for wisdom and honor. But he's only doing a little folly. Brother so-and-so is doing just a little bit. He's just teaching tithes and offering. He just che cheated on his wife. You know, I mean, what's wrong with that? You know, but, you know, he's done a lot of work for the kingdom, the brotherhood, just, you know. And so I want to look at that word apothecary uh, just to get a detail here uh, in Ecclesiastes 7543, a perfume, compound, apothecary, spice. So you put some dead flies with this perfume, this apothecary, you mix it. It still sinks, sends forth a stinking savor when you mix those two. So when you mix right just a little bit of sin with the same re reputation of wisdom and honor, it still stinks to God. He doesn't like that smell. Still, he doesn't like that. That's what he's describing it like. So this is the picture that God wants us to have. Look at Proverbs uh, 15 verse 4. Uh, Proverbs 15 verse 4. So we can get, get another picture here. Because we got to get rid of it, saints. Recognize it and get rid of it. Because God can smell it. Proverbs 15 4 says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness therein, the Bible says, is a breach in the spirit. Now, whenever you see on the news that another uh, oil tank burst in the ocean what happens is that small little burst that breach it cons continually consistently just flows out and pollutes the whole region of that part of the ocean and it just kills the animals uh kills the fish and it just pollutes it it has a stink as well that it brings uh fracture is the definition of breach in hebrew ruin uh, destruction, crashing, affliction, bruise, vexation. Uh, so a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Perverseness therein is a tree in spirit. So he can have a whole, or she can have a wholesome uh, tongue, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. It's like it's a burst. It's 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 something that comes out and it just pollutes everything else. That's what a uh, perverseness therein uh, causes. And you can see it and you can smell it. Look at Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 when it comes to uh, the subject of uh, giving to the saints. Philippians 4 13. Where Paul is talking to the saints. He says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened in me. Now in the later verses, and we read this verse a lot. Some people have them you know, on their shirts. They get Philippians 4 13 tattooed on them. It's a, it's a scripture that is very popular for the tattooing department. And, you know, people that get tattoos, they just, Philippians 4.13, they put it on their arm. But uh, in the previous verse, he says, uh, verse 11, uh, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I am learning in whatever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be a base, I know how to abound everywhere, and in all things I am instructed both to be full and be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And so he has a mindset where he can abound or he can suffer for need. But Philippians, are they have a giving mindset where they're, well, we're going to supply your need because we love you. That's why we're going to give it to you. Um, verse 15. No, verse 14. I was standing, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now, communicate is not, uh, is dealing with the subject of communicating concerning giving. That's what the subject of communicating is in this verse. Uh, 
Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So he's telling them through this letter, and at the same time all churches who read this, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only, only you are open to receive and give. You guys are only open to that. You have no problem with that. But the other churches have that problem. Verse 16, not, not for even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. So they consistently gave to this brother. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received the Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing uh, to God. So this is comparable to when Noah, when he offered up the clean animals uh, unto God and he, he smelt the sweet smell. He's telling the Philippians that this is an odor of a sweet smell to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is So this is what uh, it's like to get to the saint. So you don't smell anything physically. Um, you just give to a saint or some saints in need or a church in need, a minister in need, a widow, uh, a saint that has a, needs a bill paid. Uh, these are the things that God smells when God sees this and it's done from the heart. So when it comes to our walks as well, our walk individually, God is requesting through the scriptures that we walk circumspect. Look at the scriptures in Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. Looking at verse 22. We're going to be talking about uh, Jacob and his father Isaac. And also Esau. Genesis 27. Now we all know what happened. Esau, he sold his birthright for some lentils. Bread and pottage of lentils. Esau despises birthright. Okay? So in Genesis chapter 27, verse 22, and God could see that. He, he could see that. Genesis 27, 22, the Bible says, Jacob went near unto Isaac, his father, and he felt him and, and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. He said, Bring it near to me. And I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him. And he did eat. And he brought him wine and he drank. And his father Isaac said to him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of of a field which the Lord hath blessed, he says. The Lord hath blessed. So the Lord is going to actually bless Jacob. Now he thinks he's doing it to Esau. But remember, Esau already sold his birthright. And he's going to bless him at the same time. God is in agreement with the blessing. He says, as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. And Jacob is going to be that same thing. As a field that the Lord has blessed. Because with Jacob, he's going to multiply uh, Israel. Matter of fact, he's going to call him Israel. God is. Verse 28. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren. And let thy mother's son bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee. And blessed be he, he that blessed thee. Now I want to look at verse 29. He says multiple things here. Let people serve thee. Let nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren. Look at this. And let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that cursed thee. And blessed be he that blessed thee. This is a promise that God had concerning Jacob. 
So when it comes to, and he made the first promise to Abraham, out of all, from you, from your loins, you know, will come many people, or will come a nation. And so here is a promise uh, that he passed down. Now this is before Isaac uh, passes away. Now Jacob does the same thing before Jacob passes away. He blesses uh, some of his children. Now we want to look at another verse here. Uh, Concerning Genesis chapter 34, because Jacob is going to do the same thing. At this point, Genesis 34, uh, verse 27. Now, this is where Jacob now has children. Uh, this is where we read about concerning one of Jacob's daughters, Dinah, where she was raped, where they made an agreement for the man wanted to marry her. And there was two men who uh, did contrary, Simeon and Levi, to what was supposed to be done. In Genesis chapter number 34, verse 27, it says, The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep, oxen, asses, and that which was in the city, and that which was in the field, and all their wealth, and all their little ones, and their wives, took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. Now, they even took the little kids. Kidnapping. They did some kidnapping. Not just killing the males, but kidnapping. Um, they stole some animals. Stole some wealth. Verse 30, it says, And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land. Among the Canaanites, and the parasites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. Look what they said. They said, Should he deal with our sister as with the harlot? So understand, saints, concerning how you resolve problems. The problem is being resolved, but they still had that vengeance in their in their heart. Um so when it comes to us, if we resolve a problem our way and not how the Bible says to resolve, if somebody curses us out, somebody cuts in front of us, we throw them the finger, you know, or we try to chase them down, road rage. And Houston is a, a huge road rage uh, city, you know, and it's a lot of people dying and, and getting in problems because of road rage. Um, and so, you know, your boss says something to you, you know, you... You know, when he's not looking, you go to his office, you just throw all his papers and stuff on his desk on the floor. You know, and then you, you forgot the camera was there. And then they rewind the camera and then you, you're there. And then you, you have to walk home, you know, because you got fired. But the idea is that they desire to resolve a problem. It's, and Jacob said, I mean, yeah, Jacob said, you trouble me and make me distinct among the inhabitants. He said, the Canaanites and the Parasites. They're going to read about or hear about this story. Whose son is that? Whose sons are those? Oh, that's the uh, sons of Jacob. You're going to cause me to stink. And we could cause, you know, the name of Christ to stink by our ways, our actions. Because we, if we represent the image of Christ, remember what God told uh, David uh, concerning what he did. He said, you caused the, my enemies, the other countries, to blaspheme my name. That's what you caused by your action concerning doing this with Uriah, with his wife. You've caused them to blaspheme my name because of what you've done. And so I just want to say, Brother Keith, I believe I just hand up. Thank you, Brother That was a good example you, you made. Uh, and, this, and this is a very good lesson because there was a, um, there was a couple in a road race incident. And um, so I don't know who bumped who, but it was just a slight incident. They could have moved off the road, but it escalated. I don't know what was said to who said what. Somebody heated. But, you know, I'm always reminded when I hear something like that, I tell my wife, my children, you know, because you get in an accident, you know, the best thing to do is, is to handle it, just like the Bible said, with a soft answer, you know. And, uh, so this guy bumped the car and got it so in a rage with the woman who was driving. He shot the woman. Mm. He shot the woman, and as the husband was in the car too, he tried to protect her. Then the guy shot the man in the head. 
point blank with a gun, and he fled the scene. So I don't know what was happening. I don't know what would happen inside of there, but at the same time, this is this is a big race, a road race city. But it may have happened in another city. I don't know which one it was. But you know, we have to be able to handle that the way the Bible says handle it, so we can walk away from it. Amen. So the scripture says, "Be swift to hear, slow to speak, uh, slow to wrath." And God will see that. God, God, God will repay. You don't have to repay. Uh, thank you, Brother Keith. Um, look at a few more scriptures here. Songs of Solomon. Songs of Solomon. To so make a spiritual comparison. Uh, chapter number four. Song of Solomon, chapter number four. Looking at verse number ten. The Bible says, How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine, and the smell of thy ointments than all spices. He says, Thy lips, O my spouse, drop as a honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. You know, and we just read that concerning the, the smell of the garments that Jacob had. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that Jacob had. And so what does God want his wife to smell like she, righteousness right? uh, concerning the scripture in Ephesians 5 he says 25 husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle any such thing that it should be holy and without uh, blemish. So when it comes to the comparison of how he wants his bride to smell like, uh, smell good, you know, uh, as perfume, you know, and you you know the difference and the recognition concerning if you smell something bad, if you park your car at the stoplight and there's a dead dog right outside your window, you have your window down, you put your window up because that smell is coming through. And your nose tells you, hey, there's something dead around here, you know, and it's coming through. Or if you park at the stoplight and there's some flowers, roses, you can smell them. Those roses smell good. And so when it comes to the smell, uh, Christ desires that his children uh, have a sweet smell. Ointments, garments, this was recognized in Songs of Solomon, chapter 4. But at the same time, I want to make... Comparison concerning Christ, because He's a husband, the church is a bride. Right? Look at uh, Isaiah chapter fifty, verse one. Isaiah uh, fifty, verse one. This prophet of God. We talked about him earlier this morning. Uh, this is what happens when it comes to how God seen Israel in the Old Testament. Thus said the Lord. Where is the bill of your mother's divorce meant? Whom I have put away, or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have, I, have you sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem, or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke, I dry out the sea. I bank the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stink it because there is no water and dieth for thirst, he says. He says, I could dry up the rivers. And guess what? Their fish stinketh because there's no water. It starts stinking. All the fish will start dying. I could do that. And what does God have for us? Spiritual water. He dries you up, you start stinking, smelling like Satan. Start smelling like the world. Look at uh, Amos chapter 8 again. Amos chapter 8 so we can get a comparison concerning concerning what God could dry up. Because he could dry us up, saints, if, if we are not faithful. Remove the Holy Ghost. What does the scripture say in Psalms? Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, he says. And can he? Yes, he can take his Holy Spirit from us. And then what do we have left? Well, just a shell. The only good thing we'll have is food, and that's about it. But when it comes to this world, 
you know, the other good things that are left, but afterward, damnation. And who, who wants that as an expectation? Who desires that as a, uh, as a reward? So, let's go to Amos chapter number 8, uh, verse 11. The scripture says, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. The Bible says, they shall not find it. And that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. They're going to be thirsty. God's word is not going to be there. Because why? The unfaithful saints that exalted the idols. Remember, idols back then were a big thing. Very, very huge thing. Just like it's big in Egypt and in India. Those two places that have a lot of false gods in India and Egypt. So when it comes to them going to and fro, and God removes his spirit from those men, what are they doing? The young men, virgins, they're thirsty. They're looking for to hear God's word. They go to this person that can't find it. They go to this person that can't find it. And that's what happens when it comes to God drying up the land. It can dry us up, saints. Look at uh, uh, another scripture here. Uh, Luke 23. Luke 23. It's in the New Testament. Now, this is when Jesus is talking to the people, to the Jews. In verse 28. Oh, let's start at verse 27. Luke 23, 27. And there followed him a great company of people and of women which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? So, so this is where they're taking Christ to crucify him. Right? They led him away. They led him, they laid hold upon one Simon Serena coming out of the country, verse 26. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now look at verse number 31. They're taking Jesus. Jesus is telling them, don't cry for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. And that's something we have to do. We have to weep and we have to pray. Weep and pray for our families, for those who we know, for ourselves. It says, if we do these things, if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? So what does that mean? Is he just talking about weather? Is he talking about like the woods or, you know, things? No, he's not talking about the woods or little trees. He's talking about right now it's green. You know, when there's green, there's plenty of fruit. There's, it's lively. Uh, spiritually, he's talking about spiritually. Jerusalem right now is lively. They've received God's word, a lot of them. He was there. Uh, he says, what shall be done in the dry? What happens when the Holy Spirit is completely removed from all of them? New Testament is established. What's going to happen in the dry? How more evil will they get when it's dry? If they're already evil when it's green, you know? Jesus went to different cities, um, Preach the word. But the idea is that some accepted, some didn't. If they're this evil when it's green, when it's dry, it's going to be even worse. So that's why we have to keep our oils lamps full. Because it can get very dry in your surroundings. And you want to be like a tree, as the scripture says, says planted by the waters. That's how you want to be. They're going to be dry. But you can be as a tree planted by the waters. Look at uh, Leviticus, Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 26. Let's 
looking at verse 30, where the scripture says, And I will destroy your high places and cut down your images and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. That word abhor is to see it as vile, to loathe, like you want to throw up. You ever seen something and, or smell something and then you want to just vomit, it just makes you want to throw up. That's how he is describing the Jews. He says, my soul shall abhor you. It says in verse number 31, and I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. And I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors, he's saying. So when they come and bring their sweet odors, their sacrifices, God says, I'm not going to smell that. I'm not going to smell the savor of your sweet odors. I'm not because of your works. Because the actions don't match what you're bringing. When Noah brought the clean beasts in Genesis chapter 8, his actions, his works were matching what he was bringing. God called him perfect. He had grace with the Lord. So them, they have high, high places. They have images of false gods. That's why. So what they're bringing. So when it comes to someone bringing something to God and they're living contrary outside the world, he's not going to smother. Verse 32, and I will bring the land into desolation, he says, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. The Bible says, they'll be astonished at it. The word sweet odor means to delight in. So he says, I'm not going to delight in it. I'm not going to have joy in it, even though you bring it. Amos says something very similar in Amos chapter 5. And so saints, that's why we have to match our lives here on Sunday when we leave these doors and are before the world. Because all Satan has is sin. That's all he can pr pr present. That's all he has. He desires that you agree to it. That you be like them. But they have nothing. The story is already told. Revelation is finished. All the 66 books are finished. We know how the story is going to end. Christ is going to return in midair with his angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that's how it's going to end. The devil's going to be cast into outer darkness. So if you know the end of a movie, why would you jump inside of the movie if every character is going to be ended up dying? Imagine you watch a movie and it says these characters will die. And these characters will not die. And then you say, well, I want to be those characters. The ones that are going to die? Yeah, yeah, but they're, gonna, they're not going to die. They're going to die. So when it comes to the Bible, it tells us the righteous are going to be saved and the sinner is going to be lost. But for, and, the, and the Bible tells you the end of the story of how the world's going to end, how Christ is going to come. But for some reason, they just, <laughs> they just want to follow. They just be, want to be those characters. But except... A movie is fictitious most of the time, unless it's a documentary. But the idea is that it's fictitious and this is real life. And in real life, they don't want to uh, submit to Christ and the Father and His covenant. Look at Amos chapter 5, uh, verse 21. He says, I hate. I despise your feast days. I will not smell your solemn assemblies. Again, he says the same terminology in Leviticus. I'm not going to smell it. I don't want to smell it. Leviticus 21. I mean 26, 30 to 31. So in the Church of Christ, those doing Zoom service, those continually offering up tithing or teaching tithing, those having women lead, and service B-based singing, uh, those bringing up denominational doctrine into the church those universities bringing their teaching the doctors that have learned their doctrine from those universities bringing in their teaching he says i'm not going to smell your solemn assemblies verse 22 though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings i will not accept them neither will i regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts 
Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of, the, of thy vows. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty uh, stream, he says. Righteousness as a mighty stream. So when it comes to what God is expecting, he's expecting our ways to be made right. Again, he says, I'm not going to smell it. Uh, I'm not going to regard it. I don't like it. So in our in our minds, if we're around one another and everybody's singing, we don't hear God's voice talking to us, right? But Amos is actually writing to the saints at this time, is, and he's saying to them, I'm not going to hear any of it. And then they're reading it. They're going to those places to offer up meat offerings, peace offerings, bringing instruments, singing. He says, and then they read his letter, and they have to recognize, is he talking about me? Well, are you worshiping false gods? false images or are you going to repent are you going to change because God if he sees a broken and contrite heart he will forgive he will forgive saints and so we have to have a, a broken and contrite heart toward him so he can receive us look at Hosea Hosea chapter number 14 verse 1 Hosea chapter 14 verse 1 the scripture says O Israel return Unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with your words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. And that's that's a request. Do we pray that request, take away all iniquity? Do we do do we do that? Do we ask him what is iniquity? Doctrine and morally, so we can discern between good and evil. Verse 3, Assur shall not save us. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, ye are our gods. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. This is what he's telling them to do. He says, Uh... We will say no more to the work of our hands. You are our gods. Do that. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as a dew unto Israel. He shall grow as a lily. And cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread. And his beauty shall be as an olive tree. And his smell as Lebanon. Now Lebanon has some sweet aromas. Uh, it mentions it, I believe, also in Songs of Solomon. So if you do this, that's what you'll smell like as Lebanon. And he's comparing it. So he has a reward or he has a curse. But for some reason, to please men, they always sought after the curse of these false idols. Because it was what they always talked about when they ate. See, here's what convinces a person. Because you look at this idol, he's got a head, he's got a body. This is what convinces the idol, the saint to fall to the idol, is the doctrine, the, the blessing, the fake blessing. You know, Asterisk, she blessed me. You know, the queen of the Ethiopians, Diana, she blessed me. She did this. My son was healed. I got more money. This happened. This happened. They would talk like that about this false god. And so that would convince them to, hey, I believe he's real. I believe she's real. I think I could pray to this, this image. I mean, they're doing it. You know, they're my mom, my dad, my aunts, sister, brother, cousin. So, you know, I, it's nothing wrong. I mean, everybody's doing it. I see 200 people doing it, 1,000 people doing it. It shouldn't be wrong because, I mean, how can so much people be wrong? Because it's a lot of people. I don't think that much people could be wrong. So... I think it's nothing wrong with it. Let's, let me go and we'll have fun. We'll be together in unity, right? The thing about that is that they don't recognize that their time has already passed and they've gone to the judgment. They've left this world to be either cast into outer darkness, hell, or to paradise. And so when it comes to, when it comes to the decision that they made at that time, they forgot that they have a point of departure, a point of death. And so a lot of people in this world, they get caught up in this world and then they forget, hey, you're going to die at one point. 
and then the next generation is going to come up, and they're completely going to forget about you, your existence. Just like those people who were born in the 1800s, riding horses, you know, just living life, and then they've gone away. I've seen a video. I've seen a video that someone recorded. It was like, and then they remanufactured it to, to polish it up. It was like from 1889, 1889, and then they had another video, 1905, and they were at the beach, and then they were in Paris, and then they were completely dressed up when they were at the beach, as they were, um, and they were in Paris, and the streets in Paris, they were showing different angles, it was, it wasn't built like it is today, but that is that, I was looking at all those people walk around, they were in chariots. In Paris, they weren't in horses yet. I mean, they weren't in cars yet, but most of them were in chariots. And uh, you've seen little kids walking by, ladies. And I was thinking, man, most of those people are already gone. You know, they're already dead. But they were there at that time. They were there alive. They were lively, you know, smelling, seeing, hearing, just alive as can be, you know, and they're completely gone. And so the video, it just gave me a, an image of, you know, a, a speck of time of, you know, that was there, but it's no longer there anymore, you know, and so this time here is, is here, and someone 100 years from now, if the earth's still here, could see us and say, hey, they used to be, that's how they heard music, that's how they lived, that's how they wore clothes, that's how they dressed, you know, the clothes could be completely different 100 years from now, music completely different, everything completely changed, and in their mind, they're just, they're blown by it, look at Look at the people of 2021 and how they are. <laughs> and so the idea is that this life is a vapor, saints, and our ways have to have a sweet smell before God. Uh, so when you repent, look what it says. When you repent, it says his smell will be as Lebanon. God wants that, that smell of repentance too, because that's the fruit that he's looking for. Isaiah chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 3, uh, looking at verse 16. These are some women, they can remind you of maybe some women of today. Imagine how worse they would have been if they had social media. Uh, Isaiah 3, verse 16, Moreover, the Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks, and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will smite with the scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. I want to look at that word haughty real quick. So we can get a definition of uh, what it means. H13. Uh, sore, lofty, proud. The Bible says proud is a definition. Stretch forth next is another one. Uh, so they're walking with pride as they go about. There's another comparison. Uh, <laughs> there's another comparison to the to uh, this verse right here. And uh, in Ezekiel 8 verse 17. I just want to read that verse real quick. Where it says, Then he said unto me, Has thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put their branch to the nose. So when it comes to the branch, to the nose, how do you look like, just picture it. Because if we go back to Isaiah 3, they walk with stretched forth necks. So you stretch the neck forward like this, up, haughty, with pride. When you put the nose to the branch, what do you do? The branch is here, your nose is here. You put it up next to the branch. But except when you put it up, that's how he's describing how you're walking. That's how he's describing it. You put the nose to the branch, right? Stretch for next. That's how they were acting. Verse 18, Isaiah 3, 18. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their cows and their round tires like the moon. Chains, bracelets, mufflers, bonnets, ornaments of the legs, headbands, tablets, ear earrings, the rings and nose jewels. The changeable suits of apparel and the mantles, wimples, crisping pins, the glasses. Man had glasses back then. And the fine linen and the hoods 
and the veils. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink, and instead of a girdle, a rent, and instead of well set hair, baldness, and instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth, and burning instead of beauty. This is the this is what he says. He says, instead of sweet smell, he says there's gonna be stink. He's gonna switch it, reverse it, reverse all of them. All these daughters, because of how they're acting, portraying before the Jews, uh, before his eyes. Go ahead, Sister uh, Lynn. So we're giving up the sweet smell individually to God and also whether we large or small as a church. It could be either both. Yeah, because remember, he's describing the, he's describing the Jews as a whole, mm -hmm. and then he's describing uh, Noah as one person, mm -hmm. right? Or... or yeah, it could be either the whole or one person. Yeah. That's right. Great question, though, by the way. And so uh, the works have to be righteous, you know. And so when it comes to uh, the book of Revelation, where it talks about there's some in Sardis that have not spoiled their garments. Um, he's describing that because there's some that have not transgressed like the other saints in that same church. So the other saints, they stink. But... Or they have garments that are that are um, spotted, but there's some saints and sardis that have not. So he's describing some. So great question, sister. Uh, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 12, so we could see how we ought to live. Looking at verse one, Romans 12:1. We have to be a living sacrifice. Romans 12:1 says, "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye you present your bodies a living sacrifice." Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. And perfect will of God. That's how you do it. Renewing your mind so you can prove. So when we're here at church, we're, our minds are being renewed. And as they're being being renewed, now we can recognize and test and prove what's that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So we can see this is God's will for my life. This is God's will for the saints. Why? Because we're not transformed by the world, conformed to the world. We're transformed by the renewal of our mind. So the world, they're conformed. A lot of the Jews wanted to be conformed to the idols and the false gods. They wanted to be like that because... The majority was like that, and they want to be accepted. The majority of the wives of Saint Solomon, they worship false gods. So what did he do? He conformed and he yielded to them. The Bible says he built it for them and he went with them. The Bible says, but of course, we know Nehemiah says that he was loved uh, by his God at the same time. And so there's times, saints, we have to, in this life, be swift. We have to repent. We have to change. And so many saints in the Bible changed. Who changed? Manasseh changed. Manasseh was putting his children through the fire. Idols. But he changed. He completely did a 360. Sweet smell to God. Could you imagine a, a saint in a church where the so-and-so put his children through fire? You know? In false worship. So the scripture in verse 1 Body is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. So, living sacrifice. It means you're alive, you're consistently you sacrifice your life to live holy unto God. And every day Christ is smelling. God is smelling your works and your ways. Look at Matthew chapter 3 as we begin to close. Matthew 3. As we begin to close here. This is John the Baptist. He's going to be talking to some Jews and some Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew 3, 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance, he says. 
And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So when he mentions, uh, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. So that's their protection of why they don't have to repent. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So they're saying we're good. We're good with, with God. Abraham's our father. We don't have to change. Abraham's our father too. We're Jews. We smell good too. We don't have to do what you say. We don't have to repent. You know, that's like grabbing a coat from the garbage, from the dump, where they dump trash, and you just put it on and it's been there for days under slime, under uh, different garbage around Houston, and then you wear it. And you say, I don't got to take this off. I smell good just, just like I am. You know? And you're walking around and everybody's covering their nose when you pass by. You know, and say, I'm good. I'm, I'm good as I am. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. That means we don't have to change. We're good like we are. You know? They told Jeremiah that. He's, they told him, we're not going to repent. We're not going to change. We're not going to listen to you. We're going to stay just the same way that we are. And that's how the world is. If they don't say it, they'll show it. Their actions will show it. And so we have to, have to as they... <laughs> I'll read, I'll close with this. Jeremiah 44, 16. It says, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken to thee, he says. And that's how the world is. That's how many saints who have left the church are. For those listening to understand that Christ, he told his disciples to go into all the world, preach the gospel. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Verse 19, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And Lord, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That was a thing that Peter spoke on when he told the Jews in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So when you repent, you get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You have your sins forgiven, and you receive the Holy Spirit. What does it say in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21? Concerning baptism, it says, The like figure, where it's even baptism does also now save us, not to put in way of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ. Similar thing was spoken concerning Acts 22 16, where Ananias told Paul, Now why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, the Bible says. What does Galatians 3.27 say? Concerning what you put on a baptism. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, the Bible says, have put on Christ. So you put on Christ in baptism. A male like myself, like Brother Robert, like Brother Ozan, after you confess Christ, you repent, you get baptized, Christ removes your sins and gives you of his Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse uh, number 12. It says, For as many of you, for as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, that one body. Ephesians 4 is a church. There's one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 
He's the Savior of the church, of the body, as mentioned in Ephesians chapter 5. He's the head of the body, that's Colossians chapter 1, looking at verse 18. Colossians 1.13 says, Who had delivered us from the power of darkness had, had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So when you get baptized, you get translated into his kingdom. You're born again, John chapter 3, where he's talking to Nicodemus. What does he tell Nicodemus concerning baptism? Verse 3, Verily, verily I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, the Bible says, You must be born again. You must be born again. So for those listening, understand. That Christ will one day come, as we mentioned, come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And he will separate the sheep from the goats. Those who have been faithful, he will take forever to heaven. First, those in paradise, according to the letter in Thessalonians. And then those who are on earth will be taken up afterward. And those who are not his will be cast out into uh, outer darkness. And this is a serious thing, saints. It's a very serious thing because it's our soul and God has to put us somewhere. We're not going to stop existing. We're going to continue to exist either in hell or in heaven with him forever. But uh, at, that, at this time, if there's anyone who has a question or Bible study, we can have a Bible study afterward. But uh, those listening, you can call us and we can have a Bible study with you. This time we'll be closing.